Hey team, we're going to try something a little bit different today. We're going to try a little bit of a drawing and I'm going to explain a technique that's very important for immunology and that is the ELISA. Now the ELISA stands for Enzyme Linked Immunosorbent Assay. Uh, enzyme Linked Immunosorbent Assay, which doesn't mean too much. Don't worry about it. Everyone just calls it an ELISA. And what we use it for is a way to quantify how much of a protein there is in a particular sample. So an example might be, say we want to know how much inflammatory cytokine, IL-1, there is in my blood, right? So we take my blood, we would centrifuge out the cells, and now we want to know how much soluble inflammatory cytokine is left in that plasma, the liquid component of my blood. And for that, we use an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So let me go through it step by step, and then hopefully from that, you'll understand how this assay works. So the first thing we start with is uh, a 96 well plate. So a 96 well plate has a loads of wells, 96 wells, um, but I'm actually only going to draw one. So we're looking at one of these wells side on. This is just one well in a 96 well plate. Now we have to use a special 96 well plate that contains a plastic that is sticky to the antibody. So this, in, in an ELISA, this is a particular kind of ELISA, by the way, this is called a sandwich ELISA. We need a plastic that is sticky to proteins. Now what we're going to put in here is an antibody that will only bind to human IL-1. So how you might get this antibody is you would take human IL-1 and you might inject it into a rabbit. The rabbit would then have an immune response because it's a foreign protein sequence. It's a human protein. And that immune response would contain antibodies that would bind to IL-1. So in a salt solution, we would take purified rabbit antibody, for example, that would bind to human IL-1 and we put it into this well. Now, because the plastic is adherent, remember the plastic is adherent, the antibodies will stick to the surface of this plastic. We'll come back the next day, we'll wash it out. And so now we've got a well that just contains rabbit antibodies for IL-1. We have a bit of a problem though. This plastic is still sticky to proteins. So if we put our sample in, our sample is actually going to stick to the plastic. We don't want that to happen, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to put in a protein, a non-specific protein that we don't care about that has nothing to do with the assay. It is a blocking protein. So what we use is albumin. Now albumin is the most common blood found in, um, in mammal blood. Uh, it's, the, it's the most common protein found in mammal blood, sorry. So we take cow blood and we extract the albumin from it, and it's this non-specific protein found in blood. Um, and what we do is we put, in a high concentration, albumin into the flask just for an hour or two, into the plate. And the albumin protein will now bind to the plastic, and it will cover up all the sticky spots. So now the uh, plastic plate of the ELISA is not sticky anymore. We have a non-sticky container. So now when we put our sample in, the only thing that's going to stay in that well if we wash it afterwards is something that is bound to that antibody. Those antibodies are very sticky, but they're only sticky to interleukin-1 beta. So now we put our sample in, and in that sample will contain an unknown amount of interleukin-1 beta, right? Um, and depending on the amount of interleukin-1 beta is, um, some of that interleukin-1 beta will bind to these antibodies. But it shouldn't fill all the antibodies. In this case, it's only going to fill two of the antibodies in this case. Um, and that's because the binding of IL-1 beta to those antibodies is proportional to the concentration of IL-1 in the plasma. And that's very important. That's where the quantification comes from. A very high concentration would occupy all those antibodies, and a very low concentration would occupy almost none of those antibodies. And so that's partly where the quantification comes in. So the next step, so this is what's called the capture antibody, and the capture antibody has now bound to the interleukin-1 beta found in my plasma. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put another antibody in, and this is why it's called a sandwich ELISA, because we have a sandwich here, um, of two antibodies on either side of the antigen, and the antigen in this case is the molecule we're trying to measure, which is interleukin-1 beta. So here, the, this is called the detection antibody, and it will bind to wherever there's an interleukin-1 beta found, but caught by that capture antibody. Now, attached to the 
tail of this antibody, this antibody will be raised in another species. So it might be a goat antibody for human IL-1 beta. So we've got a rabbit antibody that caught the interleukin-1 beta. Then we have a goat antibody that's acting as the detection antibody. And this, just quickly, is where a huge, where ELISA's can be hugely specific. So we like to um, we like to overhype how specific an antibody is, but they're actually not that specific. They will bind certainly to IL-1 beta, but they also might bind some other molecules, other proteins, not specifically. Um, if they've got a slightly similar sequence to the interleukin-1 beta, they might accidentally bind to it. But let's say a protein, a non-specific protein, has a 1 in 10,000 chance of binding to our antibody. If we use two antibodies, so the secondary, the detection antibody will bind to a different region. This guy is binding to a different region of the interleukin-1 beta molecule. Um, the probability now multiplies. So you've got a 1 in 10,000 chance of a non-specific binding times a 1 in 10,000 chance of a non-specific binding. So let's just say for case, for example, let's say interleukin-1 alpha, or yeah, a non-specific protein like interleukin-1 alpha binds to this antibody. It shouldn't have, but it was non-specific. It accidentally happened. The detection antibody is very unlikely now to recognize it again. So we won't get a signal off it. That's how sandwich ELISA is super specific. Now, to the tail of these antibodies is a small molecule called biotin. Now, biotin is actually a vitamin, um, but it's a small molecule. And the reason why we use biotin a lot in research is it has this peculiar thing where it very strongly binds to another molecule called avidin. Now, avidin is another small molecule. And they bind to each other very tightly and specifically. Um, now, biotin, uh, we often used to get from milk. Milk is very high in biotin. And avidin, we used to get from raw egg. Now, if you ate a lot of raw egg, you could actually end up biotin deficient because this binding is so strong, you wouldn't absorb any biotin because you've been eating so many raw eggs. But, I, like, who eats that many raw eggs other than Rocky, the greatest man on earth? Okay, so... Um, here we go. So we've put in our secondary antibody, our detection antibody. It's bound to the interleukin-1 beta. On its tail, contained a biotin. And now we can put in another solution that contains avidin. And we've, to this avidin, we've pre-attached an enzyme called horseradish peroxidase. I'm going to draw it like a cross. Here we go. This is an enzyme horseradish peroxidase. Now what I love about this is you can now start to count up the animals. We've got a rabbit antibody. We've got cow blocking protein, albumin. We've got human IL-1 beta. Then we've got a goat antibody. Then we've got a cow milk small molecule biotin. We've got an egg small molecule avidin. And then we've got a horseradish peroxidase, a vegetable enzyme. Now a lot of these, um, a lot of these proteins now and, and molecules are produced in other ways. So for example, the avidin is now called strep avidin because we genetically engineer bacteria to produce this avidin, right? Um, and the antibodies might be monoclonal antibodies produced in cell culture. So we've got rid of the need for a lot of actual organisms um, uh, uh, like vertebrates. We've got rid of the need for animals in this experiment. But in the old days, it was it was definitely done with rabbit antibodies, goat antibodies, produce, and, and cow milk and egg avidin, right? So it was back, done back in the day. Okay, so where have we got to though? What, what have we achieved? We almost haven't achieved anything yet. So now we put in a solution that we call TMB. And TMB is just a molecule. It's a small molecule that's colorless. So I'm going to draw it in black. And this colorless molecule is... Um, is um, undergoes a reaction that is facilitated by the horseradish peroxidase enzyme. So this enzyme, un peroxidase is it, right? undergoes a reaction, and this reaction now forms a colored molecule, right? And we can let this reaction go over and over again. So even if we've got a very small numbers of interleukin-1 beaters, so we have a small number of detection antibodies, because this enzyme can just keep going, we can keep producing more and more of this colored product from the colorless substrate. And this is where the detection part comes in, right? So now, um, 
we have a solution that is changing color from colorless to yellow. It actually changes from blue to yellow, but don't worry. It changes to yellow as the final color, from colorless to yellow. And that change, that rate of change from colorless to colored is proportional to the number of interleukin-1 beaters here. So the number of interleukin-1 beaters here dictates how many detection antibodies there are, which dictates how many avidins there are, which dictates how many horseradish peroxidases there are, which dictates how fast this colorless substrate gets turned into a colored substrate. We then stop the reaction and we end up with a plate with a range of colors in it. So what do we do with that bit of information? Well, in this plate, um, I'm just going to draw a small plate. Here we go. So we've got one well, two well, three well. Let's just do that. I'm just going to do a mini plate. Normally, you'd use all 96 wells. In this final row, uh, let's do one more. In this final row, we'll put standards. Now, what's a standard? Well, it's a known concentration of interleukin-1 beta. So in the top one, we might put 1,000 picograms per mil. So it turns very dark orange, right? In the middle one, we'll put a very little amount of interleukin-1 beta. And in the bottom, no interleukin-1 beta. And from that, we construct a standard curve, which is basically how yellow it is on one axis and the known interleukin-1 beta concentration. So let's say we've got 100 and here we've got 1,000 right oh my head's in the way right and what we will see is a graph here we can draw a graph through our standards these are our known points here so then if we want to know how much interleukin 1 beta is in this well right we go okay let's measure how yellow it is and we do that through um absorbance we do that through this special machine that basically it shoots a light through it and measures how much light is absorbed um, so yellow compounds all the blue light is absorbed so if you shoot a blue light through the well if it's very yellow no blue light gets through and that's why it appears yellow right um, if blue light did get through then um uh it wouldn't appear yellow it would change the color right so we've got an unknown we've, we know how yellow this well is and we can then map it so let's say it was this yellow we can then go, okay, it was this yellow, and then we rule the line down here. This is called interpolation, and we can then calculate precisely using statistical software that that is 500 picograms per mil, let's say. So by comp the whole point of this is to make wells yellow in proportion to the amount of proteins that were, uh, the amount of protein of the specific protein that we're investigating how much there was in the sample and we can do that by comparing the yellowness to a known amount of interleukin 1 beta so therefore um, we can draw these standard curves and interpolate it and so this is a sandwich ELISA um, and below will be a link to a method on how to do it exactly um, and that will give you the names of all the compounds because I've just whizzed through it Thank you.